Hi, good afternoon. I'm your librarian today, Miss Fox, and this is The Macintosh Librarian. In this show, we'll be going over classic tech, retro games, and of course, the classic Macintoshes. Today, we're going over a new addition to the library, this little guy here, the Macintosh Classic. We'll be going over some of the Macintosh Classic history as well as looking at some of the trouble spots that a new user might see if you're looking to buy one of these 30 year old machines for yourself. But first, let's start with a little history lesson from the book, Apple, the inside story of intrigue, egomania and business blunders by Jim Carlton. Paraphrasing a little bit, of course. So let's go back to the 1980s. Apple was on top of its game. It was a perfect example of the American dream. A man starting a computer company from his garage to become a major computer manufacturer. Throughout the mid to late 80s, Apple's product development leader, Jean-Louis Gasset, had pushed for computers that were expandable and more expensive, mainly to cater to the high-end business users and desktop publishers where profit margins were higher, but unfortunately sales volumes were lower. While this strategy initially was successful, the prices of the Macintosh computers were getting a little out of hand, with the Macintosh 2 debuting at $5,498 in March of 1987, which is equivalent to 12 grand in 2019 money. Unfortunately, a few months after the Macintosh 2's introduction, the stock market crash of October 1987 sent ripples of economic chaos throughout the country ultimately leaving Apple vulnerable to poor sales in a downturn economy. Additionally, Microsoft and Intel were working together in the late 80s, which gave rise to the Wintel platform, essentially Intel processor-based machines running Microsoft software, which proved to be a popular winner with business and home users, accounting for about 90% of all computer sales in 1990. With Windows 3.0 around the corner, Apple executives feared that many DOS users would see Windows 3 as an okay enough GUI alternative to the Macintosh. And unfortunately, most users did. Dissatisfied with the shrinking Apple market share in both home and education, pressure from the then Apple CEO, John Scully, and the Apple board members forced Gasset to resign. With Gasset gone, Apple engineers quickly took to building the low-cost machine that they hoped would help Apple reach a wider audience. So this brings us to 1990. Apple released the Macintosh Classic in October for a low price of $9.99 and this version here for $14.99, which came with 2 megabytes of RAM and a 40 megabyte SCSI hard drive. The Mac Classic's low cost and simplicity made it popular with the education market, where it sold for a discounted rate of $8.99. The Macintosh Classic was released essentially as a throwback to the Macintosh SE using the same Motorola 68000 processor and a similar design motherboard with the shrunken down components to make it even cheaper for the Macintosh Classic. Before we boot up the Macintosh, let me show you the special disc that we found here in the library. This Mackie disc was actually found in one of our books in the library. I don't think it was meant for public release, but oh well, I'll show you. We'll go ahead and introduce him to you. Hi, Maggie. Oh, good morning, Miss Fox. How are you doing today? Good morning, Maggie. We wanted you to help us out today in the seminar. We're actually going over your current computer, the Macintosh Classic. Hey, that's me. So let's start with Maggie's beautiful nine inch monochrome display. I seem to recall that I only have two colors, black and white, nothing in between. That's right, Maggie. Only two colors. Well, black and white TV was around for 30 years and that only had two colors. While the monochrome screen did have its limitations for graphics, the low price and ease of use made this computer popular with students, teachers, and of course, the librarian. Don't forget the games! The Macintosh Classic came with the Motorola 68000 processor, clocking in at 8 megahertz. Blistering! A little slow for its era, but fast enough to get the work done. It may have taken me a while, but I got there. Mackie's currently running a 40 megabyte SCSI hard drive installed in the factory, and he's actually running system 7.1. 
which is upgraded from the stock System 6 that shipped with this Macintosh. Also, we went ahead and upgraded his memory to 4 megabytes. 4 megabytes. How many megabytes does an elephant have? So let's go ahead and open you up, Mackie, and let's see what makes the Macintosh Classic work. Open me up? Uh, what? Oh, don't worry, Mackie. It'll be fine. We're gonna go ahead and transfer you to the Apple Newton first, so you can still help us out in the library today. I'm going on a road trip! So let's go ahead and get the transfer program started. Got your keyboard down here. Not gonna need that in a second. Got your mouse. Not gonna need that either. All right, it looks like the transfer is complete and we'll just wait for the Newton to reboot. But for now, let's go ahead and open up the Mac Classic. So before we open up Mackie, I recommend using a nice microfiber towel. This way, when we put the Macintosh down, we don't scratch up its little, nice, beautiful little face. Oh, hey Mackie, welcome back. We're just about to open you up. Talk about an out-of-body experience. So first, there's four T15 screws that we have to undo on the back of the case. Oh. There's two under the handle and two near the bottom of the case. Not there. In order to get the ones on the handle, we'll need a long screwdriver. Oh uh, yeah, long screwdriver. Oh, this yeah. will be good to get the ones that are hidden behind the handle. So let's go ahead and start opening these up real quick. So once we have all the screws out, basically all we need to do is start lifting up the case. Carefully. Unfortunately, on a lot of these Mac Classics, the front of the case is actually a little difficult to get off. And this is where we need a flathead screwdriver. Oh, yeah, and a, screwdriver. a little microfiber towel combined with the flathead screwdriver, we can safely take off the front lid without marring the front I case. Got no scratches so on I'll me. just be covering the screwdriver with the cloth and going between where the case and the lid meet, and it should just pop right in. All right. Remember to always be safe when working inside a computer, especially one with a CRT. Please refer to the description below for a video on how to discharge your CRT safely. All right, so the first step in taking out the Mac Classic motherboard is to remove the ROM riser board from the side of the case. This ROM riser board actually gives us an extra megabyte of RAM and has additional slots for two megabytes of RAM. Oh. Giving us a total of three megabytes. Wow. So slide it out. So here we have the two megabytes added in and then the one megabyte built in. So about those elephants. Let's get this out of the way. To remove the motherboard, we need to take out the SCSI ribbon cable, that one there. the floppy ribbon cable, that was important, and the Molex adapter My power. that was meant for power and video and sound that goes to high voltage power board. Mm -hmm. Once we have everything disconnected, we can just slide the logic board on out. If I only had a brain. So here we have the Macintosh Classic logic board. We have one megabyte of RAM built in. And this is where the RAM expansion slot fits in right here. It gives us an additional three megabytes of RAM. Upgrades! While four megabytes isn't that much, it is enough to run a lot of the word processing apps and some of the simple black and white games of the time. That's right, Miss Fox. I could play all the games. You can run all the games, Mackie. We still run into memory issues sometimes when we have programs that were created, especially that were created in the mid-90s when OS 8 and OS 9 were out and popular. Do future. One popular upgrade for the Mac Classic is to upgrade this logic board and use one for the Mac Classic 2, which actually has the Motorola 6840, I believe, which clocks in at 16 megahertz. So one of the first things that you want to do when you're buying an older Mac like this is to replace the clock battery. That's my thicker. So here we can see the clock battery has already been replaced with a AA and a half battery that I got from Amazon. And this is important to replace because battery acid corrosion, corrosion can damage your Macintosh Classics logic board to the point of no return. Ah! It can eat through the traces, it can ah! 
eat through the actual board itself, <gasps> and sometimes even the chassis. <gasps> even eat away at the plastic case itself. <gasps> and I didn't want to see this happen to Mackie. I'm too young! Another thing that can hurt your Mac are leaking electrolytic capacitors. Leaking? The Macintoshes of the late 80s and 90s used electrolytic capacitors that were notorious for leaking, especially after 30 years. That's so young. So these capacitors are little cans that are filled with electrolytic fluid, which typically is about 70% water and 30% electrolytic fluid. Um, oh, the power! Which helps store electricity in the capacitor. When the fluid leaks, it can yeah. cause shorts on the logic board <gasps> and eventually eat away at the traces and the legs of some of the components. Oh, no. Which I've seen on some of my logic boards before I got Mackie. Ew. Uh, the majority of the boards out there that have the dreaded checkerboard issue where you <gasps> beat up the Mac and you just see a bunch of checkerboards, most likely it's just leaking capacitors. One trick that you can do to make sure that it is just leaking capacitors is actually doing the dishwasher trick. Oh, for a spin! I'm sure some of y'all have already heard about the dishwasher trick, where you put the logic board in the dishwasher, make sure you take out all the RAM chips, Brains. and all the ROM chips that are removable, all the important stuff, and let the dishwasher do its trick. <sighs> this is an attempt to get rid of the leaked electrolytic fluid Yucky. from the logic board. And sometimes this is enough to get your old board working again. Just make a wash. So if you have the dreaded checkerboard issue, try this first, and then try doing a recap. Surgery. Personally, I did this myself, and it left behind some residue. So I went ahead and used some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip, and gave Mackie's logic board a nice little scrub-a-dub. Sometimes a good scrub-a-do is all you need to get your Macintosh Classic or Classic 2 working again. For me, that's exactly what this Mac Classic needed. It was just a little scrubbing. Rub a dub dub, scrub in the tub. I'm sorry I made such a mess of things, Miss Fox. I'll try not to do it again. It's all right, Mackie. I went ahead and replaced all your leaking capacitors with tantalum capacitors, which are essentially solid state capacitors that use a piece of metal as the electrolyte rather than using fluid. That way these won't leak in the future and they should be more reliable and last another 30 years. Wow, that's a long time. I'm sure our viewers might want to see how to do that. Mackie's already working hard on the video editing. For now, all you need to know is that replacing your capacitors and your battery should be top priority if you're looking to make your Mac Classic reliable and usable in the long term. And if you want to go on the cheap side and use another electrolytic can capacitor to replace your old ones, you can, but over time, the electrolytic can capacitors will leak because the fluid will just eat away at the plastic of the bottom of the capacitor and get back onto your motherboard. Oh, geez. So I would recommend replacing your caps with tantalum capacitors and that way they won't leak and they'll still be reliable and usable. Yay! I'll go ahead and put a link below in the description for which uh, tantalum capacitors I used and the order links from DigiKey. When looking for a classic Mac to purchase for yourself, I would recommend finding one that either boots and works perfectly fine or at least boots up to a checkerboard screen which hopefully just means that this board needs a recap. Or a wash. And if you get a board that boots up to the question mark disk, well then you know, probably the capacitors are okay, but there might be issues with the system disk. Maybe you need a new SCSI hard drive, or maybe it's time to upgrade to a solid state drive. Mm. And now for the analog board. Personally, I haven't done any recapping or work to the analog board, other than messing with the potentiometers or pots Basically, have the knobs on the back of the logic board that are used to adjust the screen. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Today, we're going to adjust your screen to get the best picture possible. I am a little long in the tooth. Oh, I know. You still look good. You're very handsome. Oh, shucks. But we need to get your picture and your tube lasting as long as we can, so we don't want any damage to happen. Damage? So, let's adjust your contrast and brightness and make sure you're dialed in just properly. Be careful back there. Got the horizontal size. There you go. Vertical size. Ooh, oh, oh, Oops, good, I'm good. sorry, Maggie. You look like a little sausage. Oh, that's better. Oh. Vertical centering. Let's get you back. Uh, let's get a little wonky here, Miss Fox. Oh, don't get sick on me, Maggie. 
like the last time I was on a mail truck. Like contrast. Oh, I'm getting a tan. Perfect. A little brighter. A little brighter. Brightness. Oh, it's too bright. Too bright. Okay, so for the brightness and contrast, we want to make sure that these are dialed in just right. So you want the brightness to be as low as you can tolerate so that you can make Mackie's tube last as long as possible or your Macintosh's tube. I want to be the Paul Rudd of Macintosh Classics. Got the focus. What prescription do you have? And finally, almost done. Horizontal centering. Oh, no, round two. There you go, Mackie. Now you're looking good. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Mackie. But now your image is better than ever. I guess I'm ready for LA. Here is a diagram of the adjustment knobs for the Mac Classic and Classic 2. They're not labeled on the case itself, so it's good to have this image to adjust your screen and make it look as best as possible. Personally, I use a wooden barbecue skewer to adjust the knobs. This is because you don't want to use something metal in case you make contact with some of the capacitors or components of the analog board, which that. could be deadly. So any new Mac Classic owner should take time to adjust the screen, especially the brightness level. It's good to set the screen brightness as low as you can tolerate in order to keep the tube lasting as long as possible. All right, Mackie, well, let's go ahead and put the Mac Classic back together and transfer you back. I see me there and over there. Do you have everything? Don't worry, Mackie. I think we got this covered. I hope you don't end up with any spare parts. Well, let me get it turned on first. Can I transfer now? I still have to plug it in. What about now? Now? What about now? Right now. All right, let's go ahead and turn you on and transfer you back to your body. One, two, three. <gasps> Music to my ears. Yay! We got a big, good boot. And hopefully a little smiley Mac. There we go. Smiley Mac. Yeah, Mackie, we're back in business. All right, let's get a transfer in. What's the hold up? Mackie, looking at the library requires patience. Oh. Let me just use your mysterious disc. All right. And then we'll transfer you back to the Mac. Oh, good. The new one's getting a little stuffy. See, Mackie, you came together just fine. And you were worried about my skills. I might still have a screw or two missing. Now that you're all back in one piece, do you want to help us go over what we learned today? Uh, yeah. Then we can get to those games. First, we learned that the Mac Classic was Apple's first low-cost and mass-market Macintosh computers. We know to look for capacitor leakage and clean off my logic board with a good toothbrush scrubbing. No more leaking, Mackie. We learned to take apart the classic Macintosh and adjust the screen. And you want to always be extra safe when you're working anywhere near the monitor of Mac Classic, like me. Well, that's all for today's seminar in the library. I hope you enjoyed our little overview of the Macintosh Classic. We hope to see you back again soon for more videos. Bye. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs>